Hello again, folks, in 114. Today we're going to be covering section 8.2. Here's the calendar. Today is Tuesday, June 15th. So, 8.2. The packet I have for you today consists of this, of these. Uh, here's an overview. It's a bit cluttered. I'm going to add uh, little annotations to this, so if you're following along, um, I'll try to do that too. Just to help you remember, um, here's another sheet. These are the formulas that you're inclined to employ doing the Section 8-2 um, homework in my lab. Okay. Uh, let's see what else. There's a table for some terminology. I always like to separate that. And another diagram uh, discussing similar and congruent figures. Okay, I'm going to add a little bit down here. Uh, then there's basically the same information. I printed this in black and white. Normally I wouldn't color. I just swiped these uh, from your textbook. But they're a nice uh, explanation for shapes. And then we'll do some examples. Okay. So if you're following along, do print that out. And I'll fire away here. Okay. And we'll adjust the light. And we'll get started. This is a little too dark sometimes, but uh, it could just be the bulb is getting old. Anyhow, this is an overview of the subject of Section A2. Uh, so let's go through this. Um, <clears throat> what really you're responsible for are the, what is in red and what is in blue, as usually the case. Um, the subject of the uh, section is polygons. Now, polygons are basically a two-dimensional shape within the plane, so it's mathematically flat, no thickness, all right? Uh, more of a virtual thing than an actual real thing. Real things are three-dimensional. Uh, enclosed by three or more straight lines, which means that the very bare minimum uh, would be something like a triangle, okay? Now, when it comes to triangles, let me just zoom in on this. Uh, you could define a triangle uh, either by its angles or its sides, which is why there are so many names for triangles. There's six of them, right? Some are kind of an overlap. Uh, in other words, you could name a, a triangle could be simultaneously meeting, uh, you know, two conditions. Um, anyhow, let's start with this, and we'll work our way left to right. Right. If you're defining a triangle by its angles, right, and there would be three naturally, all of them would be less than 90 degrees. Right. I'm using, I, just to keep it as concise as possible, I use this symbol, inequality symbol, oriented in this arrangement, as less than 90. Which means that if you examine any one of the angles, usually Uh, symbol uh, designated or denoted by these arcs. First angle, two arcs is a second angle, three arcs is a third angle. Any one of them would be less than 30. They would have to be. There is the situation where you could have an equilateral triangle, right? Um, that is also acute, all right? And that, the definition of an equilateral triangle, though, is really defining the triangle by its sides. And in that instance, uh, just not to give you an actual number, but to generalize, a little tick mark is usually thrown across each of these. Now it looks like a flux capacitor, right? 
um, to indicate that these are all the same. Right? If you just see one tick mark, that means that uh, whatever that amount is, it's the same here and here. If you see two tick marks in, uh, in unison, uh, that implies that there's a distinction there, right? And three would be the third distinction. Anyhow, back to this. If you're defining, again, uh, tri uh, triangles by their angles, right? A right triangle officially is the one that has a box in the corner to denote one is a 90 degree angle, right? The others may be whatever they are, right? But you will definitely see that box if it's a right triangle. Is that the, whoever wrote the problem or drew the picture is not being lazy, right? If, on the other hand, you happen to have two triangles, right? What that means is that one of the angles, probably this one out of the three, is somewhere between 90 degrees and 180. Um, it can't be 180 exactly, because then it would just simply be a straight line and not a two-dimensional shape. It can't be 90, because then it would be a right triangle instead. So it has to be something in between these. Right? 91, 100, uh, 79, whatever it may be. And then these would be very, very narrow in that instance. Back over here, where we define triangles by side lengths, all right, again, if they are all equal, uh, you would best refer to that as an equilateral triangle. Now, coincidentally, um, equilateral triangles also are equiangular, which means that if you bothered to examine the, um, the interior angles of the triangle, they would all be the same angle. Right. That's kind of a special case. Right? An isosceles triangle has a tricky definition. Right? Um, superficially, to me, it's, it's, uh, I've always thought of it as the witch's hat triangle. This was my own way of remembering it. But which is hat because of the tallness of it by comparison. Um, the definition formally is that it has at least two sides that are equal, which means likely this side and this side are equal. Right? And this would be, again, two tick marks to indicate that it's some other number, some other measurement. Right? But the trick here is that it's at least two sides. Now, technically speaking, an equilateral would also be isosceles. Technically, right? the same in this orientation. Right? Um, because if it's at least, that means it could be the third side is also equivalent. But why bother calling it isosceles then? Why don't you just call it equilateral, right? Anyhow. There is a third category here. Well, uh, actually, let me give you one a little hint here. Isosceles triangles, the type that have at least, uh, just two, stop, two sides equal, um, they have this condition as well, that the, uh, the angles, the base angles are equal. All right, whatever that angle here and the angle here would be. Um, not really responsible for that, but that is a fun fact. Scaling triangles have no equal sides. So to denote that, you'll see one tick mark, two tick marks, and then three tick marks. No equal sides. Okay. So you can have an acute triangle, all angles less than 90, a right triangle, one exactly equal to 90, an obtuse triangle, the angle that is here that is obtuse is somewhere between 90 and 180, meaning it's greater than 90 and less than 180. Equilateral is all three sides officially equal. Isosceles, at least two sides are equal. And scaling is nothing equal. Okay. Now, if you get over to here, we get into quadrilateral territory. Um, 
you could quadrilaterals, uh, uh, quadrilaterals are four-sided polygons, right? whereas triangles are three-sided, polygons are four-sided. Now, there's two subcategories here basically of quadrilaterals. Right? You might have the less stringent, uh, strict of the two right? um, criteria, which is that you have one pair of parallel lines enclosing the shape. Um, that would be something that looks like this. All right. um, to uh, denote that two lines are parallel, uh, often you will see two arrows pointing like this, all right, drawn onto the uh, sides that happen to be parallel. It's a little bit out of whack here, sorry. It's because I'm looking at it in a funny way. Sorry, that's a little bit better, right? These two sides, that one pair, they're parallel, okay? And therefore it is best referred to as a trapezoid. Now I mentioned this other one. I drew a second trapezoid here because um, even though the bottom one with the blue arrows here is probably the more likely of the two that you would see in pop culture, right? <laughs> Famous trapezoid. Um, it doesn't, it, that's not the limit of it. If you, it, it look, this looks a little bit more symmetrical than this one, granted, but this one is still technically a trapezoid, even though it kind of looks like a different thing. Even if this was a 90 degree angle in here, all right, even if this was a perfectly flat side, not, not uh, sloping at all, straight up, all right, this would still qualify as a trapezoid by the definition of one pair of parallel lines, all right? If you have the slightly stricter condition of uh, a quadrilateral four-sided shape that is um, two pairs of parallel lines, there are these options here. You might have a rectangle or you might have a rhombus. This is the pl pluralization of that rhombi. Rhombus is, I think is legally okay to say that, but that doesn't sound as cool, right? Like fungus, fungi. Um, my knee hurts, I'm sorry. Um, I'm just pulling apart here. Right. Rectangles have, by definition, uh, four, they're quadrilateral with four right angles. So you would see this if you're going to be very precise uh, in the picture. This is badly drawn again because of the shadow. Hopefully that's, no, that's just even worse. I have to be like right on top of it. And then you can look at my bald head here All right. while I do this. Okay. That's better. All right. Looking at an angle, I, I seem to be not quite synchronizing. I'm like a broken projector. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, parallelograms that have four right angles specifically uh, are rectangles. All right. Rhombuses if you were going, it's similar to the situation with triangles, you can define something by angles, you can define something by sides. If you define a parallelogram according to its sides, and specifically that it has four equal sides, all right, this is most basically referred to as a rhombus. If you meet both conditions simultaneously, that is that you have a shape, a parallelogram, so it's four-sided, enclosed, flat, that is both four right angles, or contains four right angles, and has four equal sides, then you are the creme de la creme, chef's kiss, you are a square, all right? Who knew being a square could be so cool, right? All right. But it is, it, it, you know, it's meeting the most strict condition of a quadrilateral, really. The sides are parallel this way, and they parallel this way, so if you really wanted to, you could also draw arrows like so, in pairs. These rhombi also have that, just slanted in this case. And these rec this rectangle has that situation. Okay, um, what else can I get? It's not important today, but uh, let me just refer back to the trapezoids here for a moment. The alien species of the quadrilaterals, all right, the trapezoids are attacking. If you, uh, when we get into area, 
and you're trying to calculate the area of a trapezoid, um, remember this, a trapezoid has two bases. So they might refer to this top one as B1 and this bottom one as B2. Right? It also has a height. And the height is a little uh, weird, perhaps. If you had this situation, the height would just simply be this edge here. If you had this more symmetrical looking trapezoid, there would probably be a dashed line on the inside with a right angle, and that would be the height. Okay. Just kind of save that in the back of your head for um, section 8.3 tomorrow. All right. Um, now just to complete this thought, let me back this off for a minute and I'll just mention these other things. Um, the triangles and the quadrilaterals are probably um, the most important thing, which is again why I designated these red and blue. Um, and I went into elaborate details, but these other things are also feasible, all right? If you keep changing the amount of sides one higher, all right, to um, a five sided shape, a six sided shape, a seven, an eight, a nine, eleven, a twelve, and skipping over quite a few. 20, right? These are the names specifically, right? And I tried to show the shape adjacent. Now, um, it, to me, it would be practical to know a pentagon, right? A hexagon, an octagon, and a, a decagon, right? Um, these first three, because you see these in everyday life rather regularly, a stop, even a stop sign is an octagon, right? A honeycomb is a hexagonal shape. You know, floor tile is often a hexagonal shape, right? Uh, the United States stands for the Pentagon. Uh, the military intelligence basically is in that shape of building, literally. Now, um, just for the sake of consistency, notice this nomenclature as it unfolds. Pentagon is five, hexa is six, hepta is seven, all right? Hepta rhymes with uh, septa. And uh, September, even though we regard it as the ninth month, right, was at one point the seventh month. Right. And the, the nomenclature proceeds from there. All right. um, octagons, all right. October is the tenth month currently, right? but at one point it was the eighth month. Like an octopus has eight limbs. You know, um, well, an octagon has eight sides, right? So this would be eight. Nonagon, although I didn't draw the figure, uh, and it's less commonly known, is a nine-sided shape. And then it's decagon here. The um, things that follow it, and decagon, I believe, is the correct pronunciation of this, is 11. And dodecagon, or duodecagon, depends on who you talk to, it is a 12-sided shape. And then your book skips over to uh, a 20-sided shape, which I mispronounce every time. Uh, Icosagon, I believe it is pronounced. Anyhow, the triangles and the tri quadrilaterals, very important. Please try to, in the long run, do you know memorize this sort of organization. But realize that there are things beyond it, as always. Okay? And there's a system to, la to labeling, you know? Seven, eight, nine, ten, Deca, you know, and there are not. Okay, that is an overview of section eight two. Incidentally, if you find, I hope, because I specifically designed these, hoping that they'll be useful. If you do find this overview very useful, then propagate it. You can have it, right? Use it in your own explanation. Okay. Now, very briefly, um, let me discuss this. Insofar as the math um, calculations, formulas, and models uh, relevant to the section on polygons we're in, this is the model that you're probably going to use, right? and these are the two formulas that you're going to use. Right? When you're given similar figures, we're going to get into that in a bit, similar figures are proportionate, and since they are proportionate, you can use 
um, this model to write an equation, which means that you have just basically four parts to fill in, right? As long as you have three out of the four, that is if you have the, the clear majority, you can always figure out right, the missing part. Right? Now, how, there's more than one way to do this usually, but uh, this is the system I would stick with. Whatever dimensions that you could read from a first shape that you're comparing to a second shape, make those the parts that sit in this uh, ratio, this glorified fraction here and then make the dimensions that correspond, that is, they're related, in the second shape, the parts that sit here and here, in this ratio, all right? When you're attempting to solve a proportion, uh, remember, you cross multiply. Okay? Now, if you're given a triangle specifically and you want to figure out um, the uh, one of the three angles, the interior angles, the sum of interior angles for two-dimensional triangles are 180 degrees always. Right? That could also be calculated from here. But again, as long as you know the majority of information, right, the two out of the three angles, you could always algebraically solve for uh, the missing one, whichever one is missing. If you're given a polygon in general, right, you could figure out, it's not going to be 180, it'll be something greater, the sum of the interior angles using this formula, right? Figure out the number of sides of the shape, subtract 2, and then multiply by 180. All right, so if you had a triangle, it would be a 3 here. 3 minus 2 is 1, 1 times 180 is 180. If you have a regular polygon, Right, which is a, a definition I'm going to get to. The interior angles will all be equ equiangular, which means they're all the same. Whatever they are, they're all the same right, for that particular shape. Th knowing that will be to your advantage if you had to figure out if it was part of a more complex problem. So that's why I put this bullet point here. Okay. This is really as difficult as the math is going to get. You're going to use formulas or potentially model for this section. Okay. Now, if you're curious, I mean, how, how did anyone decide that this is 180? Um, there's a very nice explanation in your book. So, well, let me just uh, try to go through that really quickly. You remember, perhaps, from Section 8.1, when we were talking about parallel lines um, cut by a transversal. And it ends up forming uh, relationships. Angle relationships. So here's uh, very quickly, two parallel lines. This is a bit faint, I'm sorry. Let's see if that's visible. That's nah, just outside the camera. That's a little bit better. If they are cut by a transversal, it would be in a line like so. And they'll be um, alternate interior alternate exterior or corresponding angle relationships, right? What if you had a second transversal put by two transversals instead, but they are united at this point here? Here's a second transversal, all right? They would form a triangle enclosure, at least uh, in between this red, blue, and this, this segment of the uh, black line here. Sorry if this is a bit faint. Now very quickly, um, some definitions, axioms, all right, um, well, the formal, formal definitions that we are aware of is that a straight line would be 180 degrees total, right? 
vertical angles, which is the kind of thing you get when you have the uh, scissor action, you know, uh, two frost lines, would produce an angle here, whatever it is, that is the same here. Right. Um, the angle here would be the angle here, that segment of the total 180. And the angle here would be the angle here because they are um, corresponding angles. So even if you don't know what that specific angle is here, you know that it would have to be the same because they're corresponding. One inside, one outside the parallel lines, but on the same side of the transversal, this red one. Same thing here. Whatever this is would have to be the same here because it's one inside and one outside the parallel lines, but on the same side of the transversal. Right. There are corresponding angles, whatever they are, in red, and there are corresponding angles in blue, whatever they are, I'm just saying it just dyslexically, and there are vertical angles that are equal. So by, also by virtue of the fact that a straight line equals 180 total, again, even if you don't know what the angles specifically are here, here, and here in these three wedges, right, by these relationships, they would have to be 180 total interior in this triangle. Right? It just so happens that if you had all these types of shapes, whether you had some funky looking um, trapezoid esque looking shape or not, you know, even a pentagon, something like that, you can cut them into triangles. Right? So, for example, if you cut the parallelogram like this, Right? You have a triangle in this area, and you have a triangle in this area. Right? And since the triangle has been defined as 180 degrees at this point, the interior angles, you'd have 180 in total here, and 180 in total here. Right? And that will help you identify you know, how many degrees the interior angles would be in that situation. Right. If you had a parallel, pardon me, if you had a pentagon, you could do something similar. You could cut it into triangles. So you cut this into triangles like so. You have a triangle, a triangle, and a triangle. Right. That would be 180, 180, and 180. All right. Let's see if it holds up. I'm just curious now. All right. If it's 180 times 3, so the interior angles here, that's 0, 24, carry the 2, is 540 degrees would be the interior angles in here. This formula that I mentioned can be used without going through the process. So if you have a, a cutting, now uh, if you have a pentagon, you have a five-sided shape. So you would have a 5 for the number of sides minus 2, which is, again, 3 times 180, right, which would be 540. It's neat, isn't it? That's the cool thing about math that unfortunately it doesn't get credit for. It doesn't have, uh, you know, it's not sexy enough math in, in, in a sense of the word, in a certain context. All right? We don't, we think of it as being inhuman, all right? But it's based upon very fundamental information that anybody can get, all right? And we can build upon that consistently. Okay? Now, let's see, let me uh, do an example with you, and then we'll move on to definitions in a moment. Um, here's some examples, I'll try to uh, obscure part of it so I can write. Here's my bootleg Microsoft Paint. Uh, 
Okay. Let me clear this up too. Um, this is uh, angles of an octagon, a stop sign being a perfect example. It's a little bit obscure, but if you notice on the edge of that stop sign, there's a little arc there. The angle symbol, and it's an exterior angle, it's not an interior angle. All right, the stop sign has the shape of a regular octagon. Um, a regular octagon just means that it's all same sides, side lengths. and uh, equiangular interior angles. Right. Yeah. So you can count on the angle in here, in here, in here, in here, consistently being the same thing, okay? A regular octagon has eight, uh, is an eight-sided figure with all sides having the same length, it's repetitive and all interior angles having the same measure, that's equiangular. All right, A, measure, uh, determine the measure of an interior angle, okay? We would use the formula from before. Let's see if this is visible. Um, the sum of interior angles would be equal to the number of sides minus two, times 180 degrees. And since you can cut any shape larger than a triangle basically into triangles, all right, we could rely on this formula. All right? That's just gonna give us the total. All right? um, number of sides of an octagon, we already have it described to us, but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we would substitute an eight in here. Subtract two first by following the order of operations. We're just sticking with one side of the equals here. And I hope that's not too faint. That's a little bit better, right? And this would be six, which you will multiply by 180, zero, 48, carry the four. And you have 1,080 degrees total inside here. Now, we're going to find the measure of an interior angle. How many interior angles would there be? Well, if you count them, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's the same as the number of sides. So what you would have to do now is you would have to divide this total by the number of interior angles to get an individual interior angle. Eight goes into 10 roughly one time with two left over. Eight goes into 28 roughly three times with four left over. Eight goes into 40 exactly, 135. Okay, degrees. So the angle right here is 135 degrees and any of the others would be as well. The measure of an interior angle is equal to 135 degrees. All right. If you want to get the exterior angle, which just to highlight, is referring to this portion of the drawing here, you could take advantage of um, angle relationships that you're already familiar with. So um, it's a little hard to see, so what I'll do is I'll draw it here. We have this going on here adjacent angles that seem to have a supplementary relationship. This is angle one. It's called angle one, right? Since this is a straight line, by definition, it would be 180 degrees total, right? All straight lines are 180 degrees total, and it is supplementary. The angles are supplementary. So what we would really need to do is basically subtract from 180. 
just because I'm short on space, 180 minus 135. I would draw here, but it just doesn't feel right. Um, that's 10 minus five is five, four. This angle here should be 45 degrees, the balance of 180. The measure of angle one should be equal to 45 degrees. Okay. So take advantage of formulas, take advantage of angle relationships that you know from a while back, at least yesterday. <laughs> okay. Let's get into some formal definitions. Get rid of this, it was unnecessary. Uh, there we go. Um, here's some formal definitions. Again, we are talking about polygons. Uh, officially, a polygon is a closed figure in a plane. Closed figure in a plane means mathematically flat. Right. It's 2D. Right. And it is determined by three or more straight lines. I hope this is visible. I think I gotta get rid of my black here. It's not really writing so hard, so let's see. I have drawers upon drawers of used markers here. There's another one for the pile. So let me reiterate to make sure it's clear. A polygon officially is a closed figure in a plane. That just means that it's mathematically flat. You can say it's 2D. Right? Determined by three or more straight lines. Three is the minimum, that's why a triangle is the, the first polygon. Okay? Uh, we kind of alluded to this already, but let me make sure it's clear. A regular polygon meets two conditions, or it has two conditions. Uh, it is a polygon in which number one, the sides are equilateral. That means they're all equal. And two, the interior angles are equiangular, which again means they're all equal. Equilateral and equiangular. Knowing that is very helpful if you're trying to, like, as in the last problem, conclude what an individual angle is worth. All right. Now, what's going to become important uh, subsequently yeah, is this: the this idea of proportionate. Um, just for the sake of space, let me put this here. Parity. Proportionate. Uh, in our context, this is when shapes are the same but different sizes.
by some consistent factor. Meaning that all of the sides are shrunken or enlarged by some multiple. Shapes that are the same but different sizes. They're the same type of shape. Okay. Um, then there's these two concepts which we're going to get into. Um, there are similar figures. And there are congruent figures. Uh, more recently, I came up with another diagram, so I'll just stop here. There's a, uh, a symbol for a similar. It's one squiggle like so. Right? There's a symbol for congruent. It's a squiggle with an equals under it. Okay. All right, now let me show you the other slide. Um, what is really important here is make this distinction about regular polygons and proportionate. What is proportionate? All right, the formula, oh, pardon me, the uh, diagram that I want you to examine looks like this. I just made this yesterday uh, to summarize. Okay. We have, when we're examining figures, uh, essentially two or three possibilities. Right? A third possibility, which is not listed here, would be that they're not at all the same. But that's not interesting. So um, what is interesting is that we might have congruent figures or we might have similar figures. How do you distinguish them? Congruent figures are basically the same shape, all right? Like a clone, all right? They're the same shape and the same size. Think of this as being clones. Attack of the clones, all right? If sh figures are similar, that's what I was just alluding to before, they're the same shape, but they're not the same size, all right? Um, you might, <laughs> if you think of, um, a person and their child as being, you know, looking identical, even though that's not really possible. Um, it's like uh, mama and baby. It's like a smaller version of the parent, if you will. So similar looking. Right. Um, if you get into the weeds here, here's the, the actual conditions. Um, Congruent figures have corresponding angles that are equal and corresponding sides that are equal. Corresponding means related. Directly related. Okay. Similar figures are, have corresponding angles that are equal, so you can count on that much being the same. But the corresponding sides are merely proportionate, all right? They're not the same size. Again, they are either uh, smaller or larger by a consistent factor. something that you multiply by. Okay. Now, uh, just to um, elucidate, let's consider these drawings here. Right. Um, I drew two triangles that are identical here. They're congruent figures, they're identical. All right, so, um, First of all, let's do the obvious. Um, let's say that these are right triangles, so I'm gonna put a box here and here to represent a 90 degree angle. And then go all the way down, okay? If, um, 
I give it some numbers, say. Um, this isn't really correct, but if I call this um, A, B, and C, dimension here, the side length dimension here, and what would technically be a hypotenuse here, then these would be D, E, and F, perhaps. The angle here and here, regardless of the size, would be the same. The angle here and here, regardless of the size, would be the same, if they're truly, whether they're similar or, or, or uh, congruent figures. All right? When it comes to correspondence, all right, if we're talking about this angle and this angle is the same, and it's along the side of that angle and the 90 degree, that angle and the 90 degree, this side and this side would be referred to as corresponding. Just it means directly related. The thing directly across from the box here would normally be referred to as a hypotenuse if it's truly a right triangle. This dimension side length and this dimension side length would be corresponding as well. And B and E. Okay. Even though in spite of the fact that these are different sizes, you could form a proportion equation um, given that much information. So again, let's just pretend that this is our 90 degree angle here. And this is A, B, and C again. And a 90 degree angle here. And this is called as D, E, and F. If this angle is the same as this angle, then in this orientation compared to that one, again, this A side dimension would correspond To this D side dimension in the larger figure. Right. And again, if this is across from it, the box here, then this would correspond to this. They're not the same figure, but they're corresponding. this would correspond to this. Okay? You have to be very careful, all right? You need two angles to say that this is the same, this is the corresponding side comparatively here and here. All right, it's the dimension that would be in between these two angles. This is the dimension that would between, be between these same two angles. Remember, the angles is not something you really have to worry about when you're talking about proportionate figures. It's the side lengths that may potentially be different. Okay. Um, let's do an example. Okay. I'm going to sort of paraphrase example three from the worksheet. Give this a rest. Oh, is it drawn? I don't think it is. Example three uh, from the, uh, the packet of examples looks like this. It's describing um, a tree on a sunny day casting a shadow. So to illustrate, um, here's a tree on the ground. And it's a happy tree too, like Bob Ross. 
reference here. Live in its less, its best sort of apple tree life here. Okay. All right. Anyhow, the, there's a person standing in the drawing as well, which we'll just put here. And because of the nature of the sun behind the tree, um, as would be, there's a shadow that is cast by the tree along the ground. And if this person happens to be you know, adjacent to the tree, they similarly um, cast their own shadow, which is just superimposed here, a smaller shadow. If the tree height is unknown, but the person's height is, and their shadow length is known, And it's easier, arguably, to measure the length of a shadow because it's on the ground. If this is 45, and let's just be a, make a consistent unit, 6 feet, 9 feet, and 45 feet. By virtue of the concept of similar figures being proportionate, we can write a proportion equation using these three out of four parts. What this is called is um, shadow reckoning. Shadow reckoning is an indirect way to measure the height of something. something otherwise inaccessible. Again, a person would have a hard time measuring the height of a tree, you know, because you're not tall enough. All right, even if you use the tape measure, it might fall over while you're in the process. It's not just a one person job. However, Measuring the length of something along the ground is not that difficult, provided you have, you know, a long enough ruler of some sort. Anyhow, you can engage in shadow reckoning all right, by taking advantage of the fact that similar figures, as you see this blue triangle and this red triangle superimposed within it, are proportionate. And therefore, we could write a proportion equation. So I will turn this back on for a moment. And go back to that little model from earlier. What I would encourage you to do is make a system that you could rely on. Oh, come on. It's a little hard to see, but uh, just focus on this area here. This is the model that I want to employ here. If similar figures are proportionate, then I could write a proportion equation, which would follow this basic shape here. Right. What I would do is um, take the dimensions from a first shape and make them the parts 
of your first ratio, the first fraction, if you will. And then take the, the parts from the second triangle and make that the parts of the second ratio. Right? You can maybe finagle something else, but this consistently will work. All right, now, the only thing that you must do is decide ahead of time um, what the top is and what the bottom is. So over here, I'm gonna put a little thought here. If this is the top of the fractions and this is the bottom of the fractions, let us make the top the height and the bottom the shadow, right, just to be consistent, right? In other words, when you fill in the information here and here, do it consistently, don't make it hodgepodge, you know, random. So, the height of the tree, though it's very blurry, The height of the tree is unknown, so I'm just going to put, uh, let's put the letter H here for height. Uh, but its shadow length is 45, so I'm going to put that down here, 45. If you want to put the units in, you can, but um, as long as they're all the same unit, feet, 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 you don't really have to worry. Just remember to make the answer the appropriate consistent unit. Um, if the height of the person here is 6 feet, um, remember, the height of this tree essentially corresponds to the height of this person. These are corresponding parts, upright, upright. So H corresponds to six. All right. They're not the same figure, they're not the same amount, but they're related. They're both heights. Okay. The shadow length of the tree is established as 45. The shadow length of the person, coincidentally, is nine. And again, these are corresponding. Right? They're not the same amount, as you can see, but they're related. Right? This corresponds to this. Okay? So how do you solve proportions? It's cross multiplication. And a little bit of algebra. So um, do this. Multiply diagonally this way, and then the other way. Write that, 9 times h. I'm just going to put a dot there just to emphasize that it's being multiplied. But it's a coefficient of 9, technically. This way, um, 45 times 6. I'm just going to write them uh, 45.6. You can certainly do the multiplication. There's no sin in that. But uh, hold off just for a moment because you might be able to simplify it um, before you multiply, right? or before you divide. We'll see. All right. Sometimes it's to your advantage to sort of hesitate. All right. Be strategic. All right. Anyhow, we have an algebraic equation here. If I want to solve the h, I have to move the 9. And at this point, we are, we are well acquainted with the process. To move one coefficient 9 from here to the opposite side, you're going over equals. So you perform an opposite operation. The opposite of multiplying is dividing by 9 here and dividing by 9 here. Right? Now, because this happens to be in facted form, and I didn't bother to multiply, this is sort of fake quasi-multiplication, just kind of holding a place. All right? After I just sort of simplify this and I'm left with h, I can do the same thing here. All right? If you just zero in on this chunk, this jelly bean here, there's a relationship between 9 and 45 that I can take advantage of. They're, the common fact that the GCF, that is what they're both made of, in facted form, is okay to do this. They're both made of 9. So I can simplify by 9 before I multiply, without a calculator. 9 divided by 9 is 1. If you have a denominator of 1, it's superfluous. You don't need it anymore. 45 divided by 9 is 5. Right? Leftover 5 times 6 
is a height of 30 technically over 1, which is just 30. No calculator, right? And since the unit of choice here is feet, one could estimate that the tree's height is 30 feet, which sounds reasonable for a tree, certainly, right? Okay. Um, let's do example five and then I'll stop. Right, I'm going to turn this off now and again paraphrase example five. And I'll clean this up. In the case of example five, you're given this figure, and even without the verbal instructions, you could kind of infer what they're after. Let me put this down for a moment. I want to draw a nice picture, so I'm going to cheat and use a ruler to get a straight line for once, because I'm terrible at that. Ah, the irony said you were going to do that and you screwed it up. I guess something like that. Um, and since I'm talking about a uh, trapezoidal as the figure here, I'm going to draw this on the base this way. Oof. I'm working in tight space here. The figure has these um, uh, points, so I'm going to label them to simulate. This is basically how it looks on paper. The information that you're given is that the, um, there are two angles we're going to look for, an exterior angle here, which we'll designate Y, and an interior angle here, which we'll call X. Right? And then on the rest of the inside of this, there's this much information. The angle here is 130 degrees, um, and this being a perfectly vertical line, they include these symbols here. All right, now, given no other information but the drawing, you could kind of figure out that, oh, well, I'm looking to figure out what this X is and what this Y is, right? They probably specified that in the original example, but uh, again, I'm sort of paraphrasing with the picture. We could figure out the interior angles, remember, the sum of interior angles Um, of any polygon using this formula. N minus 2 times 180, right? And as long as we have the, uh, we're aware of what these symbols stand for, and we have the majority of information, we could then figure out um, what this angle is here, right? So from this, we're going to eventually figure out what X is. And from that information, we could figure out what Y is. 
So let's fill in some extra information here. If you see a box in the corners, how many degrees does that represent? 90, right? At 90. There isn't much more that we could do with the picture, but we can add that much. Okay. Now let's figure out what the total would be. Total interior. Uh, that is 130, these 290s, and that X in theory. How many sides is this figure here? This is a, this appears to be um, a quadrilateral of some sort, a trapezoid probably. Yep. All right, well, we don't know that this is parallel officially, but if it were these two, this one pair of parallel lines, it would be a trapezoid. So this is a four that we would fit into this. Right. And therefore this would be two times 180 which means that this would be 360 degrees total. Okay. Now, um, a sort of derived formula for figuring out X would be to say, all right, well, if the total is 360, and the total is equal to a sum, which is implying a bunch of things added, then in this instance, it would be the sum of x, the sum of 130, added to 90, and another 90. And we, you can see that we have the majority of information here. Right? Remember, always engage in ordinary arithmetic before you start playing the game of algebra, which is swapping things over equals. This much is 180, right? 180 added to 130 is 310. So uh, again, a more concise way of writing this would be 360 degrees is equal to x plus 310 and then you have a one-step algebraic equation, which we can proceed with. So I'm going to draw a little table here. Keep x in place because I want to figure it out. Move 310 all the equals. So I'm going to perform the opposite operation. There's again naturally a cancellation effect. And if I did it here, I'm obligated to balance. Zero, five. So therefore, x is 50 degrees. If this x is 50 degrees, and this is a straight line, a straight angle, then a second derived equation to figure out what y is would be that it's 180 minus the balance. 180 minus 50, which is 130 degrees. Okay, so not too shabby, right? All right. Let me just check. There is, incidentally, if we wanted to, if we knew, all right, and I didn't draw it here, but if this was known to be truly parallel to this, and if I overextended this line, you know, we would see that the angle here and the angle here is the same thing. They would be regarded as alternate interior angles in that regard, okay? Alternate opposite sides of a transversal, an imaginary transversal, and interior being between parallel lines, if you know for sure that those are parallel. Right? And then you wouldn't need to go through this process. That is it for today. So, um, again, if you're following along in my lab, then try not to let it get away from you because I've noticed, um, you know, we're past the middle point of the semester. Um, definitely want to get started.
All right, in my lab, all right, do what is section 8.2 right, tonight, and that's that. Okay. All right, thank you guys. I'll see you again tomorrow. Be careful out there.